or year one biology video uh, with Mr. Phillips. Today we're continuing looking at exchange systems in the lungs and we're going to look at studying the lungs and lung disease. So first of all, before we look at any disease to do with lungs, you need to understand about four key definitions. So the first one is tidal volume. So that is the, as you're sat watching this, the amount of air you breathe in each breath. And it's about 0.4 decimeters cubed. Um, your ventilation rate is the number of breaths per minute. So that's about an average at rest 15 minutes. And then you've got two very similar terms. So you've got forced expir expiratory volume or FEV1. Uh, which is the maximum volume of air breathed out in one second. And then you've got forced vital capacity that is the maximum amount of air possible to breathe out after a deep breath in. So the difference is that the top one is if you just breathed out as much as you could, and the second one, and it's only in one second, and the second one is the amount you possibly could force out if you took a deep breath in. And you need to learn those because it's going to link to then the diseases that so you might also need to know the ventilation rate, which is the volume of air breathed per minute. And obviously that would be your tidal volume, your average breath in and out times the breathing rate per minute. Okay, so if it was it might be 0.4 decimeters times 15 breaths per minute. And on average, these are the decimeters that you have. Um, for the average um, female, it's 3.1. Average male is 4.6, just due to different body sizes. And then uh, for fit females, it'd be 4.5 and fit males would be 6.0. OK, so here we have a spirometer to trace. It's quite important to understand where we got those terms from. And basically, the spirometer is measuring the volume of gas in our lungs here. OK, and there's always at the bottom a residual volume that we can't get rid of. So your lungs never completely run out of oxygen or air, I suppose you should say, in them, because obviously they collapse in themselves. We don't want that to happen. So what happens is as you breathe in, the amount of air goes up and then you breathe out, it goes down, up, out, up, out. That's your tidal volume. Then if you take a deep breath in, it'll obviously go up more, and a deep breath out, it will obviously decrease to that residual level, and you push all the air out. So that is just um, how we measure it, basically. And you might be given some sort of graph question based on that, which I'm sure there's lots of examples which uh, your teacher can give you. Um, and then you might be asked to calculate the FE. A more complicated example that you might have to work out is calculate the FEV change between two um, two lines. So, for example, if you were calculating the percentage change of FEV from line A to line B, you would look and you see, right, well, line A, it's at four, line B, it's at one. OK, so all this percentage change calculation is the difference, the change, which would be three, divided by the total population, the total, total FEV, uh, which would be four. So effectively, you just do uh, one minus four. OK, which is the final value, take away the original value, divided by 4 equals 0, minus, 0, minus, minus 75%. We'll get it eventually. OK, so this question, I think, quite important. If we look at the actual individual lung diseases, you could be asked, why do why generally all the um, lung diseases result in patients that feel tired and weak as the main symptom? Well, if you think about it, it's all about getting oxygen into your body. If you reduce the rate of gas exchange in the alveoli from the environment, what you do is you reduce that oxygen diffusion into the bloodstream. The body cells therefore will reduce, receive less oxygen and the rate of aerobic respiration will decrease. So less energy is released and therefore sufferers will feel tired and weak. And that could be an answer for any question linking any particular disease to why tiredness is, is a problem. Let's have a look at a couple of different diseases then. So tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is a shocking disease in that it affects a huge number of people around the world. But most of the time, it never goes past a, um, a latent stage where you don't get any symptoms. So most people's immune system find, fend it off. But basically what happens when it does start to cause you problems um, is that the immune system tries to attack it and it builds up a wall, wall around the bacteria called tubercles. The infected tissue dies and therefore the gas exchange is reduced in that area. And you can see them on the x-rays shown. Um, that leads to persistent cough, coughing up blood, chest pains, and you basically can't get enough oxygen, so you get a shortness of breath. Um, it reduces your tidal volume and therefore you have to breathe more and have a higher ventilation rate to increase uh, that oxygen into your interest.
And here you could see um, a difference between two people who, one person who does have tuberculosis, one person who doesn't. Okay, you can see on this one, the person who does uh, have tuberculosis has got a smaller tidal volume, but they have to breathe more often, a higher ventilation rate. The person that doesn't have tuberculosis has a higher tidal volume, and therefore they don't have to breathe in as much. Now, fibrosis or fibrosis is when you get scar tissues, okay, um, and they can be caused by infection, exposure to substances like asbestos and dust. And basically, scar tissues mean you end up with thicker, less elastic tissues. Um, with thicker tissue means it's less able for diffusion to occur over the alveoli, and therefore people generally will have a reduced tidal volume because they won't be able to get as much air into the lungs. They will have a reduced force vital capacity because they won't be able to force that air out, and they'll have to have a ventilation rate that's faster. And they'll generally have a shortness of breath, dry cough, chest pains, and fatigue. Asthma, which is obviously much more common. Uh, the picture shows asthma quite nicely. So asthma is effectively an allergic reaction. And it's where the airways become inflamed. You can see here, this is a normal airway where you've got all this um, space for the um, air to get through the, the trachea and the bronchioles. Uh, but then what happens is the, the uh, muscle tissue becomes inflamed and the airways basically gets less, um, suppose less lumen space. So therefore the air can't get through. So it's normally an allergic reaction, often dust and pollen. Um, it's smooth muscles um, lining basically contract and large amounts of mucus are produced and the inhaler relaxes those muscles. So when you take something like this, or so I've asked when I take something like my, my um, relaxer inhaler, it just relaxes those muscles, allowing the air to get in. Um, and common symptoms are always wheezing, shortness of breath, and it is a sudden onset. Again, okay? obviously it severely reduces that FEV, the force expiration uh, volume. Uh, emphysema, again, so emphysema is a long-term uh, issue that's caused by long-term smoking and exposure to air pollution. Um, and basically when foreign particles get trapped in the alveoli, it causes irritation. That attracts then phagocytes, which then uh, produce enzymes um, to break down the um, elastin, in, or trying to kill off the virus, obviously, or the, the, whatever the thing is in there, but it damages the elastin in the alveolar wall, um, and therefore they can't recoil as well. That means air can't be expelled as efficiently, and the walls start to break down, and they lose their large surface area. So what happens is people end up with um, wheezing, shortness of breath, and obviously eventually they can't do enough gas exchange to keep themselves alive, um, and you get increased ventilation rates, or breathing more, but less effectively. And you see here the difference, just the difference in surface area of the lungs um, by a person who does have emphysema or a person that doesn't have emphysema. It's a massive, massive difference. And you can see on the slide at the top here, the difference in alveoli. So the top one has got lots of tiny little spaces, which are lots of millions of alveoli. The bottom one is where all the alveoli, the walls have collapsed and sort of merged together. So no way, you might look at, might think, well, you get more air in, but no, because there's less surface area, so it can't get into the bloodstream. Uh, COPD, okay, is um, one that you possibly don't need to know precisely for your A level, but it's chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and it's when you get a combination of diseases, including emphysema, chronic bronchitis, it might be asthma on top of that, cancer on top of that, and basically it progressively gets worse in middle age and long term smokers. And common symptoms are wheezing, the shortness of breath, and you can get increased chance of chest infections. Um, and there you see it's uh, caused by lots of different um, factors. So the thing you need to know about cause and correlation with this. So risk factor is something that is known to increase the chance of getting a disease due to there being a correlation, a known link between the two. Okay. So if you smoke, you are more likely to get lung cancer, but it doesn't. So there's a correlation. But if you smoke, it doesn't necessarily mean it has caused your lung cancer. It could be something else has randomly caused mutation that has led to lung cancer, not the uh, necessarily the smoking. So the correlation is a known link causes when this has definitely caused this and we have to be careful with this looking at some information here you could look at these two data here okay and you could say okay so this graph shows percentage of males who smoke cigarettes and you can see from 1990 down to 2010 those numbers have decreased percentage of males then um in their uh sorry that have died um in the population um at, uh, I think it was early deaths, I can't remember the exact graph, that has always also decreased. 
So what you could be asked to find out is, well, what do these graphs actually show? And you can obviously link one to the other and say, well, actually, less people smoke, less people died prematurely um, or of cancer at that point. Well, actually, we don't know that's absolutely correct, okay? Because there could be other factors that affect it. And the fact is that since 1990s, we've identified asbestos as an issue. So it could be that asbestos has been removed from homes more, and therefore less people are dying of cancer. It could be improved medical treatment. So it could be the same number of males are still getting cancer, but less are dying because of our disease treatment um, and development of that. Okay. Um, now, we have obviously done a lot to stop smoking, and you can see this again um, that in the 1970s, they realised there was a correlation earlier in the 1970s between smoking and, and cancer, so they introduced health warnings, they then completely banned um, advertising on, on cigarettes, particularly on TV screens and things like that, um, and then picture warnings on now on cigarette packets, and now you know they'll be hidden behind screens so you can't see them in the shops and it's banned in public. Passive smoking, a, there was a correlation between lung cancer and non-smokers uh, due to passive smoking discovered in the 1990s. That led to the ban in restaurants that was first voluntarily and now workplace and public areas that's illegal to smoking. And hopefully we'll see that passive smoker rate uh, drop as a result. Um, asthma, okay, so you can see here with um, asthma, you've got two graphs, okay, and this is new cases of asthma per 100,000. And then this links to the amount of air pollution cut off the y-axis, which is the amount of air pollution present in the same years. And you can see clearly here that when the air pollution drops, the cases of new cases of asthma also appears to drop. So surely one causes the other. Well, we need to be careful with this because there are other factors that could cause asthma. It could be the fact that, like we just said, less people are smoking, and therefore there could be a reduced asthma um, chance of inhaling asthma and getting passive smoking into asthma, or mothers smoking, giving it to the babies, um, and also asthma developing at a young age. There could be that the existing cases of asthma are actually getting worse. It might not be that actually things are getting better overall. It might just be existing asthma is getting worse, but the people who less people are getting it. Air pollution varies massively across the UK, so it's actually really quite hard to decide that because if you live up in the Outer Hebrides, for example, in Scotland, you probably have very low air pollution, but what is the asthma rates there? So it's really hard to draw a, a comparison. Um, and it doesn't link other risk factors, so genetics and things like that, which could also cause asthma. As well. Now, still as a result, though, the correlation has led to this idea, yes, air pollution does link to asthma, so the EU have introduced a ceiling directive in 2001, which was the upper limits on total emissions of sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, and non-methane volatile organic compounds and ammonia. Um, and then lower limits have been reviewed and set for 2020. They're looking now at banning diesel engines in certain cities and increased congestion charges in others for, for more dirtier engines. Um, MOTs now have to test for cars to make sure they're not emitting too much, and the tax is done on UK cars according to road conditions. Um, and obviously, it's just looking at how we can ease the traffic. So over in this picture here, this is in um, Kings Heath, and it's classed as the most polluted road in the UK. Um, and they're doing experiments on that road to try and reduce the, the pollution. So would taking traffic lights make the road move, the cars move easier, and therefore if it move easier, less acceleration, and therefore less emissions of um, particulates into the air from the dive diesel engines. So that's just for you to think about. So that's been useful, guys. And again, I'll see you again soon. Thank you very much.